Section 10 of Movies and the Hollywood Short Story Collection, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Deb Meister. The Moving Picture Rights, Part 1, by Montague Glass. When Max Schindelberger opened the door leading into the office of Lessingeld and Bell's, his manner was that of a local millionaire's wife bearing delicacies to a bedridden laundress, for Max felt that he was slumming. Is Mr. Lessingell disengaged? he asked in the rotund voice of one accustomed to being addressed as brother president three nights out of every week, and he cast so benevolent a smile on the stenographer that she bridled immediately. Mr. Lessingell, she called, and in response B. Lessingell projected his torso from an adjacent doorway. Miss Schimpf, he said pleadingly, do me the favor and don't make such a gachet every time somebody comes in the office. Goes through me like a knife, yet. Max Schindelberger's smile took on the quality of indulgency as he advanced slowly towards B. Lessengeld. How do you do, Mr. Lessengeld, he said, preferring his hand, and after glancing suspiciously at the extended palm, Lessengeld took it in a limp clasp. I already subscribed to that now asylum, ain't it? Lessengel began, for his experienced eye had at once noted the fraternal society charm, the IOMA lapel button, and the white tie that proclaimed Max to be a philanthropist. Max laughed as heartily as he could. Ain't it funny, he said, how just so soon as anybody sees me, they think I am going to do something charitable? As a matter of fact, Mr. Lessengeld, I am coming here to see you on a business matter which really ain't my business at all. Lessengeld grudgingly held open the door, and Max squeezed past him. You got a comfortable place here, Mr. Lessengeld, he began, plain and old-fashioned but comfortable. Lessengeld removed some dusty papers from a chair. It suits me, he said. Take a seat, Mr. Schindelberger, Max said as he sat down. Used to was Schindelberger, Steinfeld, and company in the underwear business? Max nodded, and his smile began to fade. My partner Bells got a couple of the composition notes in the middle compartment in our safe for six years already. Lessengeld continued. He keeps some souvenirs on account the feller he took em off of, a relation from his wife's, was no good neither, which you was telling me you wanted to see me about a business matter. Max Schindelberger cleared his throat. Anybody could have reverses in business, he said. Sure, I know, Lessengeld commented. Only there is two kinds of reverses, Mr. Schindelberger. Reverses from up to down and reverses from down to up. Like when a fellow couldn't pay his composition notes, Mr. Schindelberger. And two years later is buying elevator apartments yet in his wife's name, Mr. Schindelberger. He tapped the desk impatiently. Which you were saying, he added, that you wanted to see me about a business matter. Max coughed away a slight huskiness when he had started from his luxuriously appointed office on Lower Nassau Street to visit Mr. Lessengeld on East Broadway. He had felt a trifle sorry for Lessengeld, so soon to feel the embarrassment and awkwardness incidental to meeting for the first time, and all combined under one frock coat. The district grandmaster of the IOMA, the president of the Bella Hirschkind Home for Indigent Females, and director and trustee of three orphan asylums of an eye, ear, and throat infirmary. With the first reference to the defunct underwear business, however, Max began to lose the sense of confidence that the dignity of his various offices lent him, and by the time Lessengeld had mentioned the elevator apartment houses, he had assumed to Max all the majesty of, say, for example, the federal grand master of the IOMA with Jacob H. Schiff and Andrew Carnegie thrown in for good measure. The fact is, Max stammered, I called to see you about the $3,000 mortgage you are holding on Rudnick's house, the second mortgage. Lessengeld nodded. First mortgages, I ain't got any, he said. And if you are coming to inseminate that I am a second mortgage shark, Mr. Schindelberger, go ahead and do so. I am dealing in second mortgages now 20 years already and I hear myself called a shark so often, Mr. Schindelberger, that it sounds like it would be a compliment already. I come pretty near getting it printed on my letterheads. 
I didn't said you was a second mortgage shark, Mr. Lessengeld. A man could be a whole lot worse as a second mortgage shark, understand me, and do a charity once in a while, anyhow. You know what it stands in Gamar yet. Schindelberger settled himself in his chair preparatory to intoning and Talmudical quotation, but Lessengeld forestalled him. Sure, I know, he said. It stands in Gamara a whole lot about charity, Mr. Schindelberger, but don't say no more about second mortgages as it does about composition notes, for instance. So if you are coming to me to ask me I should give Rudnick an extension on his Clinton Street house, you could learn Gamara to me till I would become so big a malamed as you are, understand me, and it wouldn't make no difference. I never extend no mortgages for nobody. But, Mr. Lessengeld, you've got to remember this is an exception. Otherwise, I wouldn't bother myself I should come up here at all. I am interesting myself in this here matter on account Rudnick is an old man, understand me, and all he's got in the world is the Clinton Street house. And, furthermore, he will make a will leaving it to the Bella Hirsch kind home for indigent females, which if you want to go ahead and rob a lot of poor widders of a few thousand dollars, go ahead, Mr. Lessengeld. He started to rise from his chair, but he thought better of it as Lessengeld began to speak. Don't make me no bluff, Schindelberger, Lessengeld cried, because in the first place, if Rudnick wills his house to the Bella Hirsch kind home, what is that my business? And in the second place, Bell's wife's mother's cousin got a sister, which for years, Bell's, makes a standing offer of five hundred dollars someone should marry her, and finally he gets her into the home as single as the day she was born already. One or two ain't widders, Schindelberger admitted, but they're all old, and when you say what is it your business that Rudnick leaves his house to charity, sure it ain't. Ah, uh, but it's your business if you try to take the house away from charity. Even if you would be dealing in second mortgages, Mr. Lessengeld, that ain't no reason why you shouldn't got a heart once in a while. What do you mean I ain't got a heart? Lessengeld demanded. I got just so much a heart as you got it, Mr. Schindelberger. Why, last night I went on a moving pictures, understand me, where a little girl gets her father, he should give her mother another show for a shystu. And I assure you, I cried like a baby. Such a soft heart I got it. He had risen from his chair and was pacing excitedly up and down the little room. The dirty dog wants to put her out of the house already on account she is kissing her brother, which he has just come home from twenty years on the Pacific coast, he continued. And people calls me a shock yet, Mr. Schindelberger, which my wife and me is married twenty-five years next to Kosalamod and never so much as an unkind breath between us. That's all right, Mr. Lessengeld, Schindelberger said. I don't doubt your word for a minute, but when it comes to foreclosing a mortgage on a house which it, so to speak, belongs to a home for poor widders and a couple of old maids, understand me, then that's something else again. Who says I'm going to foreclose on the mortgage? Lessengeld demanded. You didn't said you was going to foreclose it, Schindelberger replied, but you says you ain't never extended no mortgages for nobody. Which I never did, Lessengeld agreed. But that ain't saying I ain't never going to. Seemingly also, you seem to forget, I got a partner, Mr. Schindelberger, which people calls him just so much a shark as me, Mr. Schindelberger. Abba, you are just telling me your partner is putting into the Bella Hirschkind home a relation from his wife's already, and if he wouldn't be willing to extend the mortgage, Mr. Lessengeld, who would? Because I needn't got to tell you, Mr. Lessengeld, the way business is so rotten nowadays, people don't give up so easy no more. And if it wouldn't be that the Bella Hirschkind home gets from somebody a whole lot of assistance soon, it would bust up sure, and Bells would quick find himself stuck with his wife's relation again, and don't you forget it. But, Mr. Lessengeld began. But nothing, Mr. Lessengeld, Schindelberger cried. Here's where the Bella Hirschkind home is got a show to make a big haul, so to speak, because this here Rudnick has got something the matter with his liver, which it is only a question of time, understand me, on account the feller is an old bachelor without anybody to look after him, and he eats all the twenty-five cent regular dinners. I got him at the outside six months, but are you sure the feller makes a will leaving his house to the Bella Hirschkind home? 
Lesengeld asked. What do you mean am I sure? Schindelberger exclaimed. Of course I ain't sure. That's why I am coming up here this morning. If you would extend first the mortgage on that house, Mr. Lesengeld, Rudnick makes the will, otherwise not, because it would cost anyhow fifteen dollars for a lawyer. He should draw up the will, ain't it? And what's the use we should spend the money if you take away from him the house? But if I would extend first the mortgage, Schindelberger, might the fellow wouldn't make the will, maybe. Schindelberger clucked his tongue impatiently. Just because I am so charitable, I don't got to be a fool exactly, he said. If you would extend the mortgage, Mr. Lessengeld, I would bring Rudnick up here with a lawyer, and before the extension agreement is signed, Rudnick would sign his will and put it in your safe to keep. Lessengeld hesitated for a minute. I'll tell you, Schindelberger, he said at length. Give me a little time, I should think this matter over. My partner is up in the Bronix and wouldn't be back till tomorrow. But all I want is your word, Mr. Lessengeld, Schindelberger protested, because might if I would go back and tell Rudnick you wouldn't extend the mortgage, he would go right away to the river and jump in, maybe. Yow, he would jump in, Lessengeld cried. Only the other day I seen on a moving picture as a film which they called it Life is Sweet, where an old man, eighty years old, jumps into the river on account his grandson died in an elegant furnished apartment already, and when a young fellow rescues him, he gives him for ten thousand dollars a check, which I wouldn't believe it at all if I didn't seen a check with my own eyes yet. I was terrible broke up about the grandson, Mr. Schindelberger. Ah, but when I seen the check, I didn't got no more sympathy for the old man at all. Fifty dollars would have been plenty especially when the young fellow turns out to be the son of the old man's boy, which he ain't heard from in years. Sure, I know, Schindelberger agreed. Abba, such things only happen in moving pictures, Mr. Lessengeld. And if Rudnick would jump in the river, understand me. The least that happens him is he would get drowned, and the Bella Hirschkind home would go Machula shore. Well, I'll tell you, Lessengeld. You could say to Rudnick that I says I would extend the mortgage supposing my partner is agreeable. On consideration, he would leave the house to the Bella Thirstkind home, and Rudnick is to pay three hundred and fifty dollars to my lawyer for drawing the extension agreement. Abba, Mr. Lessengeld, Schindelberger began. He was about to protest against the size of the bonus demanded under the guise of council fee when he was interrupted by a resounding koosh from Lessengeld. This is my last word and the very best I could do, Lessengeld concluded except I would get my lawyer to fix up the will and shunk it to you free for nothing. I don't know what comes over you lately, Bells, Lessengeld complained the following morning. Every day you come down looking like a bear mit a spoiled tail. I got a right to look that way, Bells replied. If you would got such a wife's relation like I got it, Lessengeld, there'd be no sitting in the same office with you at all. When it isn't one thing, it's another. Yesterday, my wife's mother's assistant's cousin gets a day off and comes round and gets dinner with us. I think I told you about her before, Miss Bloomer Duckman. Nothing suits that woman at all. The way she acts, you would think she lives in a bridal suit at the Waldorfer, and she gets my wife so mad, understand me, that she throws away a whole dish of simis in the garbage can already, which I got to admit that the woman is right, Lessengeld. My wife don't make the finest simmus in the world. Suppose she don't, Lessengeld commented. Ain't it better she should spoil some simmus, which all it's got into it is carrots, potatoes, and a little chuck? It would be that she makes a failure mit gains a uda chickens, which it already costs money. Understand me. Then you've got a right to kick. That's what I says, Bells replied. Abba, that Miss Duckman takes everything so particular. She kicks about it all the way up in the subway, which the next time I get one of my wife's relations in a home, either it would be so far away she couldn't come to see us at all, or it would be so nearby that I don't got to lose a night's rest seeing her home. I didn't get to bed till pretty near two o'clock. He stifled a yawn as he sat down at his desk. All the same, Lessengeld, he added. They certainly got a nice place up there for old women. There's lots of respectable businessmen pays ten dollars a week for their wives in the Catskills already, which they don't got it so comfortable. Ain't it a shame, Lessengeld, 
that with a charity like that, which is really a charity, people don't support it better as they do. I bet yer, Fussengel cried. The way some people acts, not only they ain't got no heart, you understand, but they ain't got no sense, neither. I seen a case yesterday where an old rusher actually refuses to pay a month's rent for his son's widder mit a little boy to save him from being put out on the sidewalk. After he goes broke, understand me, and when the boy grows up, he's got the nerve to make a touch from him a couple of dollars, and the boy goes to work and gives it to him. If I would be the boy, the old man could starve to death. I wouldn't give him not one cent. They calls us shark fells, but compared to such a humming, we ain't even sardines. Sure, I know, Bells said as he consulted the firm's diary. And if you wouldn't waste your time going on so many moving pictures, Lessengeld, might you would attend business, maybe. Yesterday was ten days that fellow Rudnick's mortgages passed due, and what you done about it? Nothing, I suppose. Supposing again, Bells, Lessengeld retorted. A fellow was in here to see me about it, and I agreed we would give Rudnick an extension. What? Bells cried. You agreed you would give him an extension? Are you crazy, or to what? The way money is so tight nowadays, and real estate gone to hell and all, we as good as could get a deed of that house from that feller. Sure we could, Lessengeld replied calmly, but we ain't going to. Once in a while, Bells, even in the second mortgage business, circumstances alters cases, and this here is one of them cases. So before you were calling me all kinds of suckers, understand me. You should be so good and listen to what I got to tell you. Bells shrugged his shoulder resignedly. Go as far as you like, he said. Ah, but if it's something which you've seen it on a moving pictures, Lessengeld, I don't want to hear it at all. It didn't happen on a moving pictures, Bells. But just the same, if even you would seen it on a moving pictures, you would say to yourself that with a couple of fellows like you and me, which a few hundred dollars one way or the other would make or break us, understand me, we would be all kinds of crooks and highwaymen if we would went to work and turn a lot of old widders out into the street. Lessengeld, Bells shouted impatiently, do me the favor and don't make no speeches. What has turning a lot of old widders into the street got to do with Rudnick's mortgage? It's got a whole lot to do with it, Lessengeld replied. Because Rudnick's house he is leaving to a home for old women, and if we take away the house from him, then the home wouldn't get his house, and the home is in such shape, Bells, that if it wouldn't make a big killing in the way of a legacy soon, they would bust up sure. And that's all the reason why we should extend the mortgage on Rudnick, Bells demanded. That's all the reason, Lessengeld answered. With three hundred and fifty dollars a bonus. Then all I could say is, Bells declared, we wouldn't do nothing of the kind. What is three hundred and fifty dollars a bonus in these times, Lessengeld? But the home, Lessengeld protested. The home should bust up, Bells cried. What do I care about the home? Abba the Witters, Lessengeld insisted. If the home busts up, the Witters is thrown into the street, ain't it? What is that my fault, Lessengeld? Did I make em witters? Sure, I know, Bells. Ah, but one or two of them ain't witters. One or two of them is old maids, and they would got to go and live back with their relations, especially, he concluded with a twinkle in his eye, especially one of them by the name of Bulma Duckman. Do you mean to told me, Bells faltered, that them now witters is in the Bella Hirschkind home? For indigent females, Lessengeld added which Max Schindelberger is president from it also. Bells nodded and remained silent for at least five minutes. I'll tell you, Lessengeld, he said at last. After all, it's a hard thing a woman should be left a widder. You bet your life it's a hard thing, Bells, Lessengeld agreed fervently. Last week I seen a woman she is kissing her husband goodbye, and the baby also kisses him goodbye. Decent, respectable, hard-working people understand me. And not two minutes later, he gets run down by a trolley or car. The next week, they take away from her the furniture, understand me, and she puts the baby into a day nursery. And what happens after that, I don't wait to see it all. Cost me ten cents yet in a drug store for some mathematic spirits of ammonia for Mrs. Lessengeld. She carries on so terrible about it. Bell sighed tremulously. All right, Lessengeld, he said. Right, Rudnick, we would extend the mortgage, and he should call here tomorrow. 
If I got to lose the house, I got to lose it, Harris Rudnick declared as he sat in B. Lessengel's revolving chair on the following morning. I ain't got long to live anyhow. He tucked his hands into his coat pocket and glared balefully at Schindelberger, who shrugged his shoulders. That's the way he is talking right along, he said. Did you ever hear the like? Mind you, it ain't that he's got anybody he should leave the house to, Mr. Bells, but he ain't got no use for women. What do you mean, I ain't got no use for women, Rudnick cried. I got just so much use for women as you got it, Abba, not for a lot of women, which all their lives men make suckers of themselves, working their heads off they should keep them in luxury, understand me. And then the men dies, you understand. Right away the widders is put in homes, and other men, which ain't related to em at all, must got to leave em their hard-earned geld, Mr. Bells, so they could sit with their hands folded doing nothing. What are you talking nonsense doing nothing, Schindelberger retorted. Them old women works like anything up there. I told you before a dozen times, Rudnick. Them women is making underwear and jelly stockings and got vice versa. No. Rudnick turned appealingly to Bells. Mr. Bells, he said, do me the favor and let me leave my money to a Talmud Torah Oda, a free loan association. Free loan association? Lessengeld and Bells exclaimed with one voice. In E.D., Bells shouted, what do you take us for, Rudnick? You are going too far. Cutthroats, Lessengeld muttered hoarsely. Stealing bread out of people's mouths yet. A lot of people goes to them, or she am, and fools them into lending them money they should play Stus and Tarak while their families is starving yet. If you want to leave your house to a free loan association, Rudnick, you might just so well blow it up mid dynamite and be done with it. How about a Talmud Torah school, Rudnick cried. That's something which you couldn't get no objection to. Don't talk like a fool, Rudnick, Schindelberger interrupted. When you got a chance to leave your money to a home for widders, what are you fooling away your time making suggestions like Talmud Torah schools for? A young fellow would get along in business if he never even seen the outside of a Talmud Torah. But if the widders lose their home, understand me, they would starve to death. Yeah, they would starve to death, Rudnick said. You could trust a widow she wouldn't starve, Mr. Schindelberger. Them which didn't got no relations, they could easily find suckers to give them money. And them which did not got relations, their families should look after them. Bells grew crimson with pent-up indignation. Loafer, he roared. What do you mean their family should look after them? Bells walked furiously up and down the office and glowered at the trembling and confused Rudnick. Seemingly, you ain't got no feelings at all, Rudnick, he continued. Schindelberger tells you over and over again they are working them poor widows to death up there, and yet you want to take away the roofs from their backs even. No, I didn't, Mr. Bells, Rudnick said. I didn't say nothing about a roof at all. Why, I ain't even seen the home, Mr. Bells. Could you expect me I should leave my money to a home without I should see it even? My worries if you've seen it, or not, Bells retorted. The thing is, Rudnick, before we would extend for you the mortgage, you must got to make not a will, but a deed, which you deed the house to the Bella Hirschkind home, keeping for yourself all the income from the house of for your life, because otherwise, if a man makes a will, he could always make another will, aber once you give a deed, it is fixed und fertisch. This ultimatum was the result of a conference between Bells and his counsel the previous evening and he had timed its announcement to the moment when he deemed his victim to be sufficiently intimidated. Nevertheless, the shock of its disclosure furred the dropping Rudnick to a fresh outburst. What? he shouted. I should drive myself out of my house for a lot of witters. Kush! Schindelberger bellowed. They ain't all witters. Two of em is old maids, Rudnick, and even if they would be all witters, you must go to do as Mr. Bell says. Otherwise, you would drive yourself out of your house anyway, because in these times, not only you couldn't raise no new second mortgage on the house, but if Lessengeld and Bells forecloses on you, the house would hardly bring in auction the amount of the first mortgage even. Rudnick sat back in his chair and plucked at his scant gray beard. He recognized the force of Schindelberger's argument and deemed it the part of discretion to temporize with his mortgagees. Why didn't you told me there is a couple of old maids up there, he said to Schindelberger. Old maids is horses of another color, so come on, Mr. Schindelberger. 
do me the favor and go up with me so I could anyhow see the home first. He slid out of his chair and smiled at Schindelberger, who stared frigidly in return. You've got one big ED of yourself, Rudnick, I must say, he commented. What do you think? I ain't got nothing better to do as escort you up to the Bella Hirschkind home? Rudnick is right, Schindelberger, Lessengeld said. You should ought to show him the home before he leaves his house to it. I would show him nothing, Schindelberger cried. Here is my card to give to the superintendent, and all he has got to do is go up on the subway from the bridge, go off at Bronix Park, and take a Mount Vernon car to Amemen Avenue. Then you walk six blocks east and follow the New Haven tracks toward the trestle. The home is the first house you come to. You couldn't miss it. Rudnick took the card and started for the door, while Bells nodded sadly at his partner. And you are kicking I am cranky yesterday morning, he said. And the daytime is all right going up there, but in the night, Lessengeld, a bloodhound could get twisted. Every time I go up there, I think, wonder I get back home at all. I bet you, Lessengeld said. The other evening I saw a film by the name Lost in the Jungle, and excuse me, gentlemen, Schindelberger interrupted. I got a little business to attend to by my office. And if it's all the same to you, I would come here with Rudnick tomorrow morning, ten o'clock. By the same lost in the jungle, Lessengeld repeated with an admonitory glare at Schindelberger, which a young feller gets ate up with a tiger already. And I says to Mrs. Lessengeld, Mommer, I says, people could say all they want to how fine it is to live in the country, I says. Give me New York City every time, I says to my wife. End of section 10.